delighted to be here for this uh, uh, conference uh, jointly organized by the uh, Peterson uh, Institute and the IMF to reflect on uh, fiscal policy uh, going uh, forward. Definitely one of my favorite uh, topics. It is my uh, privilege uh, to uh, introduce uh, Larry Summers, the Charles W. Elliott University Professor and President Emeritus at Harvard. Larry has a degree from the MIT back in 1975. He has a PhD from Harvard back in 1982. In 1993, he was awarded the John Bates Clark Medal, awarded every two years to an outstanding economist under uh, 40. So you now know for a fact that Larry was under 40 once. Larry is also uh, famous for various positions that he held here in uh, Washington, D.C. And I will only mention uh, Secretary of the Treasury in the Clinton administration and Chief Economist at the World Bank. Larry is a vice chair here at the PIIE Board of Directors. Now, I'm not going to say anything else, but I want to say that Larry is probably the best person in the world to speak to us about the future of fiscal pol policy because a number of years ago, Larry was very much concerned about secular stagnation and that fiscal was not supportive enough to deliver macroeconomic stability and inflation at target. And more recently, uh, Larry has been concerned about excessive fiscal stimulus and possible excessive effects from fiscal uh, policy on inflation right now. And I'm even hopeful that Larry will be volunteering to speak about those issues tonight. Larry, please. Um, Vitor, thank you for that uh, generous introduction, sort of alleging that I contradicted myself and uh, asking myself, asking me to warm my way uh, out of it. Um, since you are the head of the IMF Fiscal Affairs Department, you owe me at least a small debt because I think I am the senior policymaker who did the most to popularize the idea that at least for a long time, IMF stood for, it's mostly fiscal. And if that's true, that makes your department uh, absolutely uh, central. It is good because that you mentioned that I was Secretary of the Treasury and Vice Chair of the Peterson Institute uh, for International Economics Board, because if you hadn't, Adam would have required uh, that uh, I do that. It is an enormous privilege to be back at uh, the Peterson uh, Institute, which I think over many years has contributed a great deal uh, to economic uh, thinking. Keynes, has a famous line about everything that policymakers say or do is the reflection of a defunct academic scribbler. For a time, I used to paraphrase that line by saying it was a fax from a Washington uh, think tank, but that line too has become obsolete. And so now everything that a policymaker does is from a blog or a substack that comes uh, from a think tank. And I think that no think tank in Washington does a better job than the Peterson Institute of simultaneously being relevant and uh, being rigorous. 
It is easy to be rigorous. It is easy to be relevant. It is actually quite hard uh, to be both. And I think the Peterson Institute does a uh, fine job of doing that. And part of that is choose is topic uh, selection. And it's hard to imagine a more pressing topic for macroeconomic reflection than uh, fiscal policy. What I thought I could best uh, do tonight to set the stage for your discussions tomorrow was reflect on the U.S. fiscal policy challenge uh, going forward and to share my concerns and share my sense of the directions in which I think things need to move and why I have the perceptions that I do. And then perhaps in the question period, we can reflect more on the broader macroeconomics uh, of uh, fiscal policy. First, the good news of which there's not going to be very much uh, in uh, this talk. I think we had an outcome on the debt limit that so far looks to me to have been in the 85th or 90th percentile of what I would have thought was likely two months ago. Two months ago, we are now extremely unlikely to default. We turned away closer from the edge of the ledge than I would have guessed was uh, likely. Some of the policy contained is, in my view, actively good. More liberalization on uh, permitting uh, is, I think, a positive thing. Some of it is debatable. The uh, extension of work requirements, which I think in some cases probably does serve a useful function. Some of it is, in my view, unfortunate, particularly the $20 billion that has been removed from uh, the IRS, which I think will facilitate immoral tax cheating and expand uh, deficits over time. And some of it is less unfortunate, the cutting of the domestic uh, discretionary budget. But all things considered, a reasonable outcome that pushes the problem out for several years puts us in a very good place. What it does not do is change by very much the long run fiscal posture of the United States. And that's what I want to talk about. And to start with, I want to offer a bit of historical perspective. In 1993, the country was seized with the importance of deficit reduction Concerns about the deficit were substantial and were seen, rightly as judged by what happened next, as significantly pushing up long-term interest rates, reducing asset values, and impeding capital formation. At that time, the CBO did not do long-term budget forecasts. It only did five-year budget forecasts, and the five-year-out budget deficit forecast was 4.5% of uh, GDP. In 2011, the nation was again seized with the importance of the budget deficit as a major issue. Probably the scariest debt limit crisis we've had took place. The Simpson-Bowles process was, uh, initiate, was initiated. There was great sorrow in many quarters that uh, 
that process did not ultimately bear fruit. At that time, the 10 year ahead deficit forecast was 3.2% of uh, GDP. The primary deficit forecast was 0.1% of GDP 10 years out, and the debt to GDP ratio was anticipated to be 77% of GDP 10 years out. Where are we today? If you look at the CBO's numbers, and I will have some words to say about the CBO's numbers in just a few moments, the CBO's numbers say that the 10 year ahead deficit is 7.3%, twi- more than twice what it was at the time of uh, Simpson uh, Bowles. The CBO forecast says that the primary budget deficit is 3.6% uh, of uh, GDP, so large rather than essentially zero at the time of Simpson Bowles. And the CBO says that the debt to GDP ratio will be 119% of GDP and rising rapidly when we get to 2033. Are those numbers likely to be right? There is enormous uncertainty in any 10 year ahead deficit forecast, quite apart from anything that policymakers uh, do in the interim, simply from economic uncertainty and from uncertainty arising from what a given set of laws and policies will end up uh, costing. But there are at least four factors that seem to me to suggest that the 7.3% estimate is very likely too low. First, the assumption underlying that is that the three month treasury yield will average 2.3% through the whole of the 2020s and the early 2030s. That is almost 3% below its current uh, level. My best guess would be 4% would be a better estimate given the magnitude of debt accumulation, given that inflation is more likely to be above two than uh, to be below two. But let's push the interest rate up by 1% in making uh, the forecast. And that adds about 1.3% of uh, GDP uh, to uh, the deficit. So now we're at 8.6. The CBO assumption, which reflects currently stated policy, is that national defense spending in the United States, which is 3.5% of GDP now, will fall to 2.8% of GDP by 2023, by 2033, even as China's defense spending continues to increase at a rate of about 7% um, a year. That defense spending as a share of GDP will be substantially lower than the high threes that it was in the 1990s when it was generally regarded as a unipolar moment and we had no credible adversary. My guess is that 2.8 is likely to be 3.8 in the absence of major conflict. That adds another 1% uh, 
of GDP to the deficit and actually a bit more once you recognize that if defense spending is higher, then there's interest, then there's extra debt. So it's actually more like 1.3% again. So 1.3 for interest, 1.3 for defense. Now we're at 9.9. CBO's latest forecast was made in February. Since that time, revenues in the first four months of this year have come in about 1% of GDP below what was expected. In four months, 1% of one year's GDP low, albeit those are months when tax collections are usually uh, larger because of the April 15th uh, filing date, though there's estimated tax and uh, there's, there's withholding. Assume that, in fact, that technical is not 1% over four months, which would be 3% a year, but assume it's half a percent a year. 9.9 plus 0.5 is 11.4. Finally, CBO, along with its mandate, assumes that all of the Trump tax cuts that are scheduled to go out um, in 2025 will in fact go out. That is not, to my knowledge, the expectation of any well-informed political uh, observer and is inconsistent with uh, the president's commitment to no tax increases on anybody with an income under $400,000. Assume two thirds of them remain, that's about another half a percent. We are now at 11% of uh, GDP and some number, perhaps 145% of the debt to GDP. Is there anything equally large on the other side? Maybe AI will produce a productivity boom, but there's already an assumption in the forecast of total factor productivity mean reverting upwards relative to its performance so far in the 21st century. Maybe we'll get good luck on healthcare costs, but there has been a small miracle of healthcare costs restraint over the last decade, which people assume is going to continue in terms of the growth rate and mean reversion to the longer term uh, mean strikes me as more likely. So I think we are looking at 11% of GDP budget deficit, and that is something very substantially greater than we have faced uh, historically in terms of out year uh, budgets. What can we say about its uh, solution? I think the least remarked, but to me, fairly evident truth is that the changing structure of economies means that you can, different people will have different values, different assessments of efficiency versus equity and the like, and will therefore have different views as to what the size of government should be. But I would submit for your consideration that for any given set of values, you should believe that government should be substantially larger over the next decade than it has been over the last uh, generation. And I say that for four uh, reasons. First, mechanically, the debt is much larger, so the interest will be much 
larger and interest spending will be larger. Second, a substantial part of what government does is take care of people uh, who are old. More than half the budget goes to Social Security, Medicare, and the component of Medicaid that is for long-term care. The share of the population that is over 65 was 12% um, in 1990. It has largely reached its new level, which will be 22% in 2030. A far older society with constant values requires that far more be devoted to the aged. There is no reason that I can see why the fact that a substantially larger fraction of the population is aged should convert anything like one-to-one -one into cuts in support for the aged. Now, there is a different calculation one can do that I did some years ago and I have not repeated recently, which is to say, well, 65 is the new 55. And so we shouldn't think about it that way. And we should, the right way to think about it is to think about how many people are within 15 years of their old, of life expectancy, or how many people are within 10 years of life expectancy and to track aging that way in some way that is taking account of these trends. Let me make a long story short and say there's basically no relief from the calculation from doing that. There are a variety of ways of doing that calculation, but you won't get any substantial uh, relief and you'll get even less relief if you recognize that for the lower half of the population, life expectancy is no longer substantially increasing uh, in America. More interest, an older uh, population. The third thing is that the relative price of what government buys has gone way up. Let me use a tendentious example that exaggerates the point, but makes it uh, clear. In 1983, we have the BLS normalizes components of the CPI so that they were all 100 in 1983. Using that normalization, the price of a quintessential consumer good actually a somewhat selected by me consumer good, a color television set is now four. The price of a day in a hospital or a year in a college is now above 600. So there has been a change in the relative price of color television sets, a quintessential private good, and hospital care or uh, education by a fact, a quintessential government good by a factor of 150. Now you can mess with that calculation. You should say you should use goods versus services. You can do all of that. And maybe you'll get it from 150 to one down to three to one or even two to one. But the basic point that the relative price of the stuff government buys, which is basically all services, is got to be right. And that means the size of government is larger. And the last point, which is a bit different, um, is just the defense point. Whatever your view about national security, maybe you think we always spend too little on national security, too much on national security, but whatever your view is about national security spending, I don't see how you can think that we don't need to spend considerably more over the last decade than we did during the 1990s, given the set of threats 
that have arisen uh, both in the European and in uh, the Asian uh, theaters. So all of this is to say that the idea that this can, this challenge can be dominantly met on uh, the spending side is I think not a plausible uh, vision unless one wants to adopt values that are far more anti-government than those that prevailed when, for example, Ronald Reagan was president of the United States. Um, it is only by having views that are far more anti-government than his that one could defend an 18 or a 19 percent of uh, GDP uh, spending uh, share. The conclusion um, is that the United States will over time in ways that are largely not recognized by the political uh, process be likely to require substantial increases uh, in uh, revenue. Here's a way of, uh, here's a way of thinking about um, some relevant uh, magnet, some relevant um, magnitudes uh, in uh, that uh, regard. The total AGI of all of those in the top 1% of uh, the AGI distribution, so people making more than about a half a million dollars uh, a year, is about 10% of uh, GDP, of which we currently extract about 3.5% of uh, GDP. If you took the moment of peak extraction from the top 1% in American history, it would be a little bit less than 50%. So if you returned to the days of maximum progressivity, 90% top rates, 70% uh, top rates, you might get another 1.5% of uh, GDP, and you might get as much as 1% from corporations that is incremental to that. But the maximum that is sort of imaginable is 2.5% of GDP from the high end. And I am not even considering um, the political constraints that would uh, affect any such uh, calcul uh, any such uh, calculation. Conclusion uh, is that we have a challenge before us that is of a magnitude that is unprecedented in our own history, but is not at all unprecedented in the history of the world, where Vitor has been part of IMF efforts to collaborate with countries reducing structural deficits by very substantial magnitudes as a share of GDP on many different occasions. But I don't think the magnitude of this potential challenge is greatly appreciated in the context of 
the U.S. Uh, debate. The good news, the good news is that while it is clearly untenable to run forever with 10%, 11% budget deficits as a share of GDP, along with uh, price stability, there is probably not substantial urgency in resolving this trajectory. The United States is fortunate in its extraordinary dynamism. It is fortunate in the set of circumstances that cause the share of U.S. market value of equity in global market value of equity to be far higher right now than it has ever been historically. It is fortunate in the attractiveness of U.S. capital that has led the dollar to reach a real exchange rate that is not that much lower than the epic, what we're seeing at the time as the epic highs that brought the Peterson Institute to prominence with its uh, efforts surrounding the Plaza Agreement in uh, 1985. And we are fortunate that even with this accumulation of debt, real interest rates are likely to be lower than we had been come accustomed to their being during the 1980s and 1990s. So there is time to recognize and address this problem. And there is enormous uncertainty. And so it is always possible that there will be surprises that will cause it not to manifest itself. But I do not believe that the American policy debate is currently viewing the American fiscal position in a way that is realistic and honest. And I think it will be necessary in coming years for there to be a quite substantial sea change in thinking. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Larry. It was a uh, fabulous uh, speech. I will come to the room in a second, but if you allow me, I will uh, start with a couple of questions. But I want to uh, tell you that I was not implying in any way <laughs> that you were uh, inconsistent. As a matter of fact, I'm of the view that given the unprecedented combination of expansionary monetary, financial, and fiscal that was put in place in this country and around the world as response to COVID-19, you ended up getting through means that you definitely did not desire, the type of fiscal support that you had in mind, and that led to a situation where inflation finally uh, took off and uh, central banks were able to decisively abandon the zero lower bound or the effective lower bound. And once that occurs, it's only natural that somebody like you, that thinks about the macroeconomic policy mix in an integrated way, starts uh, worrying about the contribution that fiscal policy uh, makes uh, to inflation. So no accusation of inconsistency whatsoever. But 
Larry, I would love to uh, understand, given the tension that you see in the long run between a fiscal policy with runaway deficits and the uh, maintenance of price stability, bringing inflation back to target, how do you see the dynamic of inflation in the U.S. in the short to the medium run? There are two kinds of people. There are people who see every nuance, and then there are people who try to have a big picture view and stay focused on the big picture view and acknowledge that there's a lot of nuance, but treat it as a little bit peripheral. I am, for better or worse, the second kind of person. And so my view of this is something like the following. In 20, coming into 2021, the United States had a projected GDP gap for the year of about 3% of GDP. It undertook between the Trump stimulus passed in December and the Recovery Act uh, stimulus passed in March, 14% of GDP in stimulus. And at the same time, it suggested to people that interest rates would stay at zero until 2024. And at the same time, it grew the Fed's balance sheet by $150 billion, $120 billion a month. And at the same time, there was a substantial overhang of two and a half trillion dollars in liquid assets from the money that people had not been able to spend. And COVID was going to end at some point, and there were gonna be a set of economic dynamics that play out, that were likely to play out, not unlike those that play out in my vacation town of Truro, Massachusetts, every spring where the economy goes from being in hibernation in on May 1st to being all gassed up and running hard on July 1st. And the end of COVID was gonna kind of generate something like that. And if you decided to put 15% of GDP in spending into Truro, Massachusetts, while that was happening, you would blow the thing out. And that's kind of what happened. And then it was enough to blow inflation from being a little below two to being in the four and a half to five range. And that was the basic big thing that happened. And then there was a lot of other stuff that happened, bottlenecks, used cars, oil prices, that caused inflation to look like it was eight or nine. And then when that stuff was going away, it was kind of negative. So that could cause inflation to look like it was below five. But basically we were a 5% underlying inflation country by September of 2021. And that's more or less what we've remained with a bunch of, with a lot of other interesting stuff having to do with bottlenecking and unbottlenecking and markups and rising and markups falling. But basically we've turned ourselves into a five, about a 5% inflation country. And that's probably where we'll stay. Um, maybe it's a 4% uh, inflation uh, country until, you know, we'll get, we'll get some negative from housing that'll really be quite good but then housing prices are rising again, so that won't stay as good as it's gonna be for another year. So we're gonna be a four and a half or 5% inflation country until something happens that makes us be uh, less. And for the last 60 years, there haven't been some things that happen that don't also involve substantial downturns in employment. It's conceivable that will get off much easier this time because there's more room for vacancies to fall than there usually is. So maybe 
vacancies can fall without unemployment rising. That's conceivable that there'll be some of that. But my guess is that the outlook uh, is that uh, aggregate demand um, will be uh, except will will need to be restrained. Whether it's going to restrain itself because of the banking crisis and because of the lags of monetary policy or whether we're going to need more is not a question on which I have a confident uh, view. I think that relative to what I thought a month ago, I would say it looks like lags plus banking crisis are having less restraining effect at present and in prospect than I would have uh, than I would have guessed. So my guess is that Fed funds are going to have to get to a point, 50 basis points or more ahead of where they are. I think it's kind of second order whether they get there 25 and 25 or zero and 50 and zero or zero and 25 and 25. You know, I don't, that, that people will be very extremely excited about that, but I think it's probably kind of uh, second, uh, second order. I think that if there was a little more fiscal restraint and so there was a little less pressure for everything to happen with uh, monetary policy. I think that might be healthier, but I don't think it's politically sort of realistic. And there's a huge analytical question that I don't really feel like I know the answer to, but I would know the, I would, I would be forcing a staff to be producing an answer uh, if I was in government, which is I mentioned this big drop in tax collections in the first four months of the year. If that sort of happened because somehow we're not collecting taxes and people are getting incomes, then that's like a big fiscal expansion. And that's like a bad thing in the context of an overheated economy. If that, ha if that is happening because nobody's realizing capital gains and therefore nobody's getting cash in their pockets from realizing capital gains and is in uh, the context of less selling in order to finance spending, then it's a partial mitigant to a thing that's restraining the economy. And one shouldn't think of it as a substantial kind of fiscal stimulus. And you could think of various other possibilities. And I don't understand it well enough. And the several people I've asked haven't understood it better, haven't understood it in a way that has made it clear to me. So that makes me somewhat hesitant about the near term uh, case. But I think the long term fiscal policy issue is probably more profound than uh, the shorter term uh, fiscal policy issue in terms of inflation. Thanks so much. Uh, Larry, uh, questions, uh, comments? I, uh, Caroline, please. Hi, <clears throat> Caroline Atkinson, Peterson Board. Thanks very much to both of you. My question goes back to Vitor's remark about secular stagnation. And if you look ahead, uh, do you think we've just said goodbye to secular stagnation? And if so, is that because of a shift in fiscal policy and fiscal outlook or because of something else? Or might, and I know you and Olivier debated this, but um, yeah, it's a good what question. happened to it? Um, So in general, when, when people said to me, as many did in 2021, well, wait a minute, you used to be worried about secular stagnation, so how come you're worried about deficits uh, now? I said, you know, I'm like somebody who was worried in the, secular stagnation got invented in the late 1930s. And 
people were very worried about secular stagnation. And then we like started fighting a war. And all of a sudden we were fighting World War II and spending a ton and they weren't worried about secular stagnation anymore. That didn't mean they changed their minds. That meant the world had changed. And so that's broadly what was behind my change in thinking. But you're asking a different question. You're asking the question that's analogous to what was debated in 1943 and 1944, which when there was a big debate among economists about were we going to have a post-war depression, were we going to return to post-war secular stagnation, and were we going to need much larger deficits, and gee, the... um, Gee, aren't we going to? Aren't we going to need that? And roughly, all the smart people in Washington in late 1943 were confident that the big thing they needed to worry about was the post-war depression, and they turned out to be wrong for some reasons that are irrelevant now. Some of it is that during the war we said nobody could buy a car. And because because all the car factories had to make tanks, and more or less nobody could buy a house, a new house, because everybody was building the Pentagon and stuff, and so there was this huge pent up demand, and that doesn't that's not an important thing, um, uh, not an important thing uh, right now. So I don't think one should know, one can know, but I guess the points that I would make are, one, I was always kind of careful to say, it feels like we've got a secular stagnation situation. There are a bunch of factors that can explain it, but who exactly knows how long it's going to last? Charles Goodhart was always worried me in before by saying, look, An aging society is a society with rising savings because everybody's worried about their retirement and there are more and more people worried about their retirement. But an aged society is a society with lower savings because everybody's despending their, decumulating their savings and selling their houses. And so maybe this isn't forever, this thing. So there was always uh and you know rising inequality was doing a lot but if you look at the trends in inequality we have a huge inequality problem in america but most of it got made in the most of it did not get made in the last decade uh matters a little bit whether you look at income or wealth but most of it got made before so some of the trends so it's not completely clear where this was going would be point one Point two is that we are now having a big bout of, at least to hear the administration talk about it, a big bout of resilience investment. Because we've all decided just in time, not just in case, not just in time, and we need to bring back production here. And what's all that mean? That all means that we're basically going to obsolete a bunch of capital early and replace it, which means a big increase in investment demand. And to the extent we're having a large green transition, you know, if we're gonna spend, um, you know, most people now think that the IRA's $400 billion price tag is way low relative to what it's actually gonna be, but that's good because it means there's gonna be lots more green stuff that gets invested in. But if you think the IRA price tag is going to be a trillion dollars and you think each dollar of IRA is associated with another dollar of private spending, then you're looking at a fair amount of uh, green uh, in, of green investment. So you've got that. Then you have... Uh, the fact uh, that uh, the debt to GDP ratio is already substantially higher. I don't think econometricians really know, but 
if you look at everybody's estimates and you look at people's calibrated general equilibrium models and you look at people who've done regressions of one kind, one kind or other, not a not unreasonable estimate would, and not one that's reaching to be high, would be that 1% of debt to GDP is two to three basis points on the interest rate. So if you say we're sort of 50 basis points up, that's like 100 base, that's like 100 basis points on the real interest rate. And then with some element of double count, but mostly not double count, an estimate would be that 1% of GDP in flow deficit is 30, 30 or 40 basis points on the interest rate. And we've got bigger deficits than we used to. So if you take all that and the Fed thinks you're, and the, and the Fed thinks, uh, thought that the neutral real interest rate was half a percent before, and that we were a 2% inflation country so that the neutral rate was two and a half you take all the stuff I just said and you say that 0.5 is 1.5, that's not a particularly bold extrapolation from what I just said. And if you said, who knows, but maybe inflation will come down to two, but maybe it'll go back up again. And then you said two and a half percent for inflation. And then you said one and a half plus two and a half makes four. That doesn't seem like it's a particularly adventurous or bold set of assumptions to make. And that's why I say I think we're likely to be in a substantially higher interest rate uh, world than we, w- than we were. And I also think there are some reasons to think that spending is becoming less interest sensitive. If you look at the average durate, the average duration of capital that's put in place, it's now much more computers and software and much less office buildings than it used to be. And so the longer live the thing, the more interest rate sensitive it is. So if you're gonna have less interest rate sensitivity and you need to restrain the economy more that's a reason why you're going to need to push interest rates uh, even higher. So that's why I'm not particularly secular stagnation uh, oriented uh, going forward, but not with uh, complete conviction. I tend to find myself more credible when I think something that I find uncongenial than when I think something that I find congenial. And so the idea that my secular stagnation theory was the key to the universe, understanding the economic universe for another decade was kind of a highly congenial view, but I couldn't really convince myself that that was the right reading of the evidence. And so I tend to put more weight on my analysis when it rejects what I would prefer to believe than when it confirms uh, what I would prefer to believe. So that's kind of how I analyze it, Carolyn. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for it. My name is Masaki Shiraka, a former governor of Bank of Japan. I have a question about interlinkage between monetary policy and fiscal policy. The specifically rationale for having 2% inflation target. The typical argument goes the the central bank is constrained by the presence of effective lower bound. Therefore, central bank needs safety margin for not slipping into effective lower bound. But now we found that fiscal policy was effective in raising inflation for better or worse. And if that is the case, then and the, it is possible to argue that we don't need having 2% safety margin. And do you, what do you think of this kind of argument? I'm not sure, I, I'm, because of the 
acoustics. I'm not sure I completely understood the argument. Yeah. Do you, I, I believe that the gist of it is uh, to discuss the uh, rationality of the inflation target. And if you have a situation where you believe that the neutral uh, interest rate has gone up, you don't need as much of a buffer and therefore the case for inflation targeting is weakened. Is this okay? That is good. That's right. So, so to the extent that you would say that, it's interesting. I had most, almost all the, let me see if I'm thinking about this right. Almost all the discussion is of the form, um, we should raise the inflation target, coming from people who think that it is painful to have recessions and they don't want to have a recession and 2%'s not that big a deal. And besides that, 2% got set in the 90s and we now think that neutral rates are lower than, even if we think they're higher than they were before, we think they're lower than they were in the 90s. So if 2% was right in the 90s, maybe 3% is uh, right now. You're making a different kind of argument. You're saying if we really think we've got fiscal policy as a super potent stabilization tool and we've shown we're prepared to use it, that would be an argument for turning two into one and a, that would be an argument for turning two into one and a half. Um, I invite you to try that argument on uh, Capitol Hill or in uh, the uh, political provinces um, in, uh, in the United States. I guess my real view of this is that I don't, I think it was a mistake to declare a numerical target. I, my view was, my broad view, I, I've said this, I've said this many, many times, is my broad view is that Paul Volcker and Alan Greenspan understood what the Delphi, Delphi oracles understood, which is that if everybody thinks you're omniscient and omnipotent, it's a good idea to speak vaguely, infrequently, and in an oracular way, so as to preserve the illusion. And therefore, um, you should not get engaged in specific numerical targets. You should not get engaged in predicting your future actions and laying out what they're going to be. And you should be not because, just because even if you're great, you're going to be wrong a lot. And that's just going to do a lot of damage to your credibility and not going to be helpful. And that you can't specify, you know, you shouldn't specify what you're going to do because what you're going to do depends on what happens. So then you say, well, you should specify your reaction function, but you can't specify all the things that might happen because they're always surprises. And so you just need to step back to humility is my broad view. And when, when the Fed wanted to, wanted to announce the 2%, they came to the Obama administration when I was in it. And I, my view was we should tell them no, that if they wanna say price stability, that's fine, but we should not choose a numerical uh, target. Um, Tim Geithner, who was the treasury secretary, argued at the time that he didn't know whether I was right or whether I was wrong, that specifying a specific number was a bad idea, but he thought part of our broad compact with the Fed was that if they wanted to specify a numerical target, we shouldn't stop them. And I thought that was a very reasonable, uh, I'm not sure that would have been my decision, but I thought that was a very reasonable decision. And the president and the administration ultimately decided to bless the 2% target. 
and uh, so we and so we have it. But I can't get myself very excited about debating whether the number should be 1.5 or 2.5 or one or three. What I would prefer to do is change the word target to range and um, leave it at that and therefore try to gradually move off of having uh, a target. I think we just have to appreciate that in macroeconomics, era's last 15 years. And so we just don't know what the nature of the problem and what the nature of the challenges were going to be. When I think back about silly judgments, judgments that I made at some point in my career that in that both turned out to be wrong, and when I look back at them, I think I should have known better. I regarded the liquidity trap as a historical curiosity through the 90s that might be relevant to Japan, but wasn't really going to be relevant to us. And I think in retrospect, I should have said, you never know what happens. And uh, things have a way of sort of coming around in different ways. And so I think trying to lock in specific uh, targets uh, is a uh, is a mistake. I think the point you're making is a helpful one because it points up something I hadn't really thought about before, which is that it's not completely obvious that if you took as a given that you wanted to set a target, that the ex ante target today would be lots higher than the right target to have set sometime 15 or 20, 15 or 20 years ago. Thanks, uh, Jeremy, please. Thank you, uh, Jeremy Zettermeyer uh, Prugel. Going back to the scenario that you described in in um, in, in response to Caroline's question, I, w I wonder what what would happen to the U.S. dollar uh, in this setting, and is there a you know danger given that you know the rest of the world, in particular Europe, is uh, more fiscally constrained that in its attempt to um, subsidize uh, competitiveness of of clean tech, the IRA is going to essentially cause a huge Dutch disease problem that kills the competitiveness of the unsubsidized portion of uh, U.S. manufacturing. Jeremy, since your neighbor wants to uh, intervene as well, perhaps we could go. Uh, Jean Pisani, please. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to go back to your uh, sort of benign conclusion about the fact that in the U.S. perhaps the situation is serious, but there is room for increasing taxes. And my simple question would be, what's the political likelihood of increasing taxes? I missed the last part of it. Increasing what's the political the likelihood is it of politically viable? coming to an agreement to increase taxes? And let's have these two questions, if that's okay, Larry. Um, I, I, one of the lesser surprises to me in the world is how strong the dollar is and how little complaint I hear from I'm just you know, when, the, when I was in government in the 90s, the dollar was not nearly as strong as it is right now. And there were all kinds of people who were really upset about the dollar and its strength and its deindustrializing America, and terrible. And I don't perceive, now some of that's because we got a 3.4% unemployment rate. If the unemployment rate gets to five and a half, then probably it'll be a, it'll be a bit different. But I am struck uh, that the politics of an excessively strong dollar do not seem to me to be a very strong uh, consideration uh, in 
the United States, maybe in part because it is considered to be contributing to inflation, uh, to inflation restraint. Um, I, I tend to be a optimist about uh, the dollar because I think currency choices are largely about alternatives. And, you know, uh, Joe Biden has this line that he applies um, in the context of elections, where he always says it's not a choice about the almighty, it's a choice about the alternative. And I think something like that um, applies uh, to, uh, the do- to the dollar. And I just don't see the world deciding that they're, that because of U.S. fiscal irresponsibility, they're going to be lots happier in an amalgam uh, with the debt of an amalgam of European uh, countries or with uh, the debt of an even more indebted than the United States aging Japan or with the debt of China given all the uh, polit- uh, given all the political uh, risks. So I am not particularly worried that the dollar will be uh, the forcing function, assuming we have a re- assuming as I do assume, that we have a reasonably responsible central bank. And um, I think we do have a reasonably, uh, resp- I think we do have a reasonably responsible central bank. So I don't think we're headed back to a Carter era uh, dollar uh, kind of uh, si- uh, kind of situation. And I don't think we're likely to get ourselves into a Louv era uh, kind of uh, kind of problem. You know, tax increases. Um, I think there's a kind of lesson if you follow politics, which is that the transition from inconceivable to inevitable can sometimes be pretty rapid. If you kind of, you know, Milton Friedman always, Milton Friedman's example, always, and Alan Greenspan's example, always of why economic research is so important and economic policy thinking is so important, was they were working on the volunteer army in 1966 or 1967. And at that time, the idea that we would switch to a volunteer army would have seemed at least as implausible as the idea of a hundred dollar a ton carbon tax does today. But then with the Vietnam War and everything that happened, the whole world changed and it turned out to have been a really valuable thing for there to be blueprints uh, for a, a volunteer army. And I think there are a variety of examples that have that character. Think about if anybody had described that the United States would ever do something like the PPP program uh, four months before the United States did the PPP program. So, you know, does the kind of, does major tax increasing look highly plausible right now? Of course not. But, you know, what can happen uh, over time uh, in different circumstances uh, is, I think, a uh, difficult uh, thing, is, I think, a uh, difficult thing to uh, to judge. Thanks so much, uh, Larry. I uh, uh, want to give the complete quote from uh, Milton Friedman, and I think that you're going to appreciate that. He basically says that it takes a crisis to make the political impossible into the politically in- inevitable. And uh, Larry, it was absolutely brilliant uh, to be uh, with you on uh, this debate. It's the best possible start for the debates that we're going to have uh, uh, tomorrow. Thanks so much for doing this. And please uh, join me 
thanking uh, Larry for his time and his wisdom.